Hey, so, so talk to me. Uh, in, in evening with, your, with my comatose mother. Yeah. Fill me in. What? And th this isn't real life experience, obviously. So mm. where was the inspiration? Uh, well, first of all, there's a clown in it. There's an evil, creepy clown that's in there. So Poltergeist had some inspiration there. Uh, growing up, I had a lot of influence from Sam Raimi, John Carpenter, those type of uh, filmmakers. Fantastic Not, filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wouldn't necessarily say overtly the style or anything like that, but it was that sense of fun, but also the fantastic and using the effects. That was really what had the biggest influence on me. I guess even early like Spielberg in that sense. But uh, coming back to the story, is uh, it's just it's your basic story, taking the conventions, the archetypes of the horror genre. Babysitter goes into house sit for a family, but how many times have we seen him house sit for a 94-year-old rotting, decomposing, comatose mother that has a giant clown doll? And then uh, we have some Dickensian nightmares, and then of course, mother wakes up. So yes, love that. I mean, it's it's got a lot of recognition. You, it's already gone on the film circuit. You've won a lot of awards. Yeah. And it was at the Salty Horror Film Festival recently as well? Yeah, that was, uh, that was one of the last ones we just played out. And then we'll have a little bit of a run in spring, and then it will be done. Um, developing it for a feature film. It's a 33-minute right. short film, uh, but it was the most successful horror uh, short film in the entire world in 2011. Wow. Yeah, and um, so that was a lot of fun. That was good. We played. Because it did, it did show worldwide. I mean, yeah. you're, you're talking about even down in Africa. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Yeah, we even won an award in Africa and uh, uh, Central America. I didn't submit anywhere to South America, ironically. Uh, they were a little you bit harder. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, a little bit. I was just like, look, Asians, you're not getting it. And so the Australians are coming up. But I mean, it was fun. I mean, we began the run in uh, in April. In April, we premiered at uh, the Famous Monsters Festival in LA. And then, uh, really, the capper was in LA again at Scream Fest, which is the number one horror film festival in the world. And so, when you made that, you know that you did something, and, and it was a really great validation for especially things that we had done. And um, and uh, it, it was a it was a really great run. And yeah, we, we got into a lot of festivals. I'll give you this stat, not that you need it, but I mean, you might want to say it. Oh, I don't I know. know, but but we got into 75 film festivals to date, wow. and we won 54 awards. Wow. And so, uh, so that's better than a, a baseball. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, score yeah. We did, we did pretty <laughs> well. We did pretty well, and I mean, uh, I mean, we won several best short. Best so when people see that your films getting submitted to a film festival, they're like, "Crap, I won't win now." <laughs> Actually, on the horror market, that did happen. Not the first few months, but later, especially as I met guys. And, you know, there's really a great opportunity where you can be like a total douche. And I met total douches. I don't know if I could say total douche yeah, on camera. Yeah, on the online version. Yeah, 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 on the online. Okay. Total crackheads. Total crack whores. No, um, no, no. I mean, you could be, you could totally be a butt. You know? And, uh, but I always looked at it as an opportunity. I mean, some people look at, I think, other people's success. And I think, unfortunately, um, in certain communities, people look at somebody's success and they're like, well, this person's this, they must have done that to get it, or, you know, whatever, they had these opportunities. Sure. Honestly, man, I was just aggressive with it. I knew uh, that we had something pretty good, but you never really know until you go out and validate it. And then, you know, just aggressively submitted to film festivals. I mean, for, I mean, we got in to the vast majority of festivals we submitted to, but we still got rejected. Right. And I think so many people, they go out and they're like, well, I'll submit to like three, four, or five, and it's always Sundance or Slam Dance. And not to, not to knock on that, but you're competing, not just locally, you're competing hugely internationally. These are festivals that the entire world submits to. And so you really have to come to the top of the froth. And even a film as successful as we did, we won't be in Sundance this year. Sure. Um, but, but is that know, really the, the demographic you're looking for? People not necessarily. I mean, not really be looking for what you were putting out there. And that's true. I mean, I always knew it was kind of more uphill because it was a horror film. But I mean, we, we played against films that played in Sundance and Slam Dance, and we actually beat them in festivals. But to come back again to it, I think one of the things that was the most fun was making the friends that I did out in LA or in Florida or in England when I went out and traveled to them. And now I have friends out there, and we're all helping each other, and we've created this great community amongst ourselves. And one of the other great things is you meet writers and you meet producers and people that you never thought that you would meet before by just getting out there right. and giving it that life and that, um, you know, that thing. And so I think that was really what was the most fun was, yeah, people would come up and be like, oh, 
You're a comatose mother. I was like, I've been, I've been waiting to see your movie because you're the one that keeps beating me all the time. <laughs> and like, uh, and you know, it was fun. I mean, it was flattering, but I mean, there were so, so many fantastic films. I mean, it was such a high compliment to get from your colleagues. Right. But then at the same time, we're friends with each other. And I mean, we didn't win everywhere we went to. And you saw some fantastic films that were hugely deserving. And, um, you know, we just, I think because of the length that we made such a longer film, this 33 minute film, and because it actually has, it's not like, a lot of short films where it's just one scene. It actually tells this whole scope and story. Yeah, and there's a whole story arc. Mm -hmm. And there's actually pathos and like almost a mythology behind nice. the story that makes you question. So it, it, it stands alone in many ways from the short film market as the whole. And so because of that, it wasn't necessarily that we were better in this or that we were better here, although the, whole, as a, the sum of the whole was definitely fantastic. Uh, I think that's partly why we had so much success was because we were doing things that nobody else was doing in the short realm. It was kind of groundbreaking in that sense. So advice-wise, you got mm -hmm. a, a filmmaker who's, they think they have a really good story, mm -hmm. and they, they want to get the crew out and everything, they go and they, they, they're ready to make this film. What advice can you give a young filmmaker? Mm -hmm. uh, preparation. I mean, for everything that I do, especially the last few projects I've done, absolutely just nothing but storyboards. I get those storyboards down, and if I, when I talk to my DP and if he needs this lighting package, or if my grip needs these, this system, I make sure they get it. And if that means I have to wait a little longer to get some more funding for it and all that, then so be it, I'm gonna do it. And, because ultimately, you know, there's a game that we're playing, and I see, and, you know, having been out on the festival circuit, you see some films that come really close that would have been fantastic if maybe they just had another thousand or two thousand or three thousand dollars, which really isn't that much money, really, when you get down to it. And, you know, they just fall short because they didn't do certain things. And so, really, you can bide your time. There is a little bit of a sense, it's a little bit of a race, but you can take your time and you can marinate it until it's just right and then it's ready to just spring on everybody. And so I would do that. It's definitely the preparation, getting that just exactly where you want it so that you've made the movie before you've made the movie. And then, then you've got you to scrounge for good sound. Good sound, your picture can be less, but bad sound is just, you're out of it. And definitely there's, there's good composers in the state. Go get an original score. Spend the money a little bit. Like that's what I'm talking about again. But that's where you would put your emphasis on is not so much on you know, all, you know, spending too much money on pre-production, but making sure that that sound element yeah. is really locked in tight. Yeah, I mean, there are some great, great artists in the area that, that, and to come back to the sound, I will, but I mean, there's some great artists in the world. You can totally storyboard. All you need are a few sessions, whether it's a short to a feature. You just need a few sessions. It's going to maybe take you another month or two, but you'll have the entire storyboard right there. Everybody will see exactly what you're going to do. I can't tell you how how helpful having those boards were during the entire production. I mean, I used that instead of a shot list, even though I had a shot list, because it was that visual reference. And it tells you that the film's going to work, and you can see where the problems are beforehand. But then, of course, getting that sound, get that music, get that sound. One of the great uh, composed Come Trust Mother was Kevin G. Lee, but a lot of people don't know who he is. Hopefully you do now. Kevin G. Lee, he's actually getting a lot of offers now. And well, his hopefully stock we'll is get Kevin G. Lee up here on the show. Yeah, do it. And actually hear some of his pieces and yeah. why he's such a go-to guy. He is. No, you got to get Kevin G. Lee. I mean, he's based down in Provo. I mean, he's he won more awards for Comatose Mother as well. I mean, everybody that worked on the flipping movie got an award. I'm not even making that up. I mean, yeah. we went from everywhere from sound. All three of my main actors won an acting award. Wonderful. Like, everything. I mean, that's the thing I'm so proud of is that everybody came together and really put together this fantastic stuff. I really believed in it. And, you know, as a result of that, I just shot a music video this last weekend down in Orem uh, for a band called Muscle Hawk. They've gotten about as big as they can in Utah. Oh, yeah. yeah, and so we made this video. It's this intergalactic dance party. There's nothing else like it out there. It's really a throwback to music videos in a sense. There's actually a story. It's more of a short film oh, than it is a music short video. Oh, flashing back to the 80s. Yeah, to a degree, yeah. And, and Comatose Mother has a lot of uh, throwback as well. But, you know, I was able to bring a lot of the team back because, you know, we, we had such a great time working with each other and, uh, you know, doing some really fun and interesting things. And, and I think that's essentially what it is. I think that's another bit of advice I would give. Like, you want to be loyal to your friends, but at the same time, you have to ask yourself, 
do I really want to make it? And, or do I really want to give myself a shot? And you know, your friend might be your best friend in the world, but they might not be ready to go up and you might be. And there comes a point where like, you know what? Like, we're gonna, you come in UAD with me on this. I'm not gonna let you shoot this. I'm gonna spend out the money and get this guy. Because you'll come up and you'll rise up together. And something that I've always said, not just with Comatose, but anytime that I feel like we've had success with, well, in particular Comatose, is it's not so much our success, and you know, I am proud, so proud of the team, but it's also Utah's success because it gets people recognizing, hey, there's something really cool coming out of Utah. I can't tell me how many reviews I've seen where it's just like, yeah, these horror freaks out of Utah. I'm not even a horror freak. <laughs> but like these people out of Utah, and it really stands out to them. Yeah. And so the fact that we do things here in Utah and can do something different, it gets people excited and does open doors for other people. So it's not just, it's not just about us, it's about everybody. And that was one of the goals was to really open the doors for other people. Whether people want to view it that way or not, that's up to them. But uh, it's something I was hoping for. But yeah, I mean, there's so much more I can talk about. You know, I love talking about this. It's been a while. You know, but uh, no, it's been fun. Excellent. Well, thanks for sitting yeah. there. Yeah. No more questions. Any more advice? It's only a ten-minute show. I know. Sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs>